Good morning, New City. I'm Daryl Bradford, one of the elders here at New City Fellowship. What a privilege it is to be able to still gather this way uh, virtually together on this day of worship. So very thankful for each and every one of you. Um, just, just really proud of New City, uh, just how we have been continuing to give and you know even supporting uh, 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 John, the, the DeRicher family, John and Kathy, regarding uh, uh, the funds that was needed to kind of make up the deficit in terms of getting them back to uh, Grand Rapids. And so how everyone has you know seemed to pitch in, pitch in uh, in that effort. And so just want to thank you for just being such a, a giving uh, congregation. Um, also, just even with, I uh, want to give a shout out to our, our, our especially our women, um, New City, with our prayer during the week. Uh, many of um, you have been uh, taking the lead in terms of being able to uh, lead uh, those prayer prayer meetings. And uh, we know that not everyone is available during that time of 6.30 a.m., but so very thankful for uh, those who are able to uh, step right in into that and lead us during our weekly prayer effort. Just want to continue to say also we do have prayer uh, Monday through Friday, 6.30 a.m. And it goes for no more than half an hour. And so please do join us if you're able to you know, join, only join uh, once a week or more, or more, please do. If you have any prayer requests, uh, remember to you can go online at newcitygr.org to submit those prayer requests um, as much as you are able. And so our prayer team are able to be able to see them and to be praying with and for you. Also, you can remember to reach out to our deacons if you are in need in any capacity. Uh, please do reach out to the deacons. You can also reach out to uh, those in your life groups, um, uh, the, the, the session, uh, or the elders of here at New City, or, or any of those on the women ministry teams. And so also we want to remember that this week we are continuing with our church care study. And so please do join us on Thursdays, uh, 8 p.m., where we have a Zoom discussion based on the lessons that we have viewed. And so you'll see an email uh, going out um, in terms of what a uh, lesson uh, to, to view. Or if you need to go back, you can uh, sign up and or watch those, um, those, those, those lessons. And so please do join us for um, our Zoom meetings, uh, 8 p.m., um, and we look forward to just knowing how to um, care uh, more um, efficiently and um, have more awareness how to care for those who have faced some very hard or are facing some very hard situations. And so I uh, also want to remember um, the, 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 the tragic uh, uh, floods that have happened in Midland. And so we want to be praying with, um, you know, all those uh, precious uh, people that were affected by it. Uh, we think of even um, our own denomination, uh, 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 um, uh, the, the pastor David uh, Serifolian and his church and, uh, and, and those were who are affected by it. So we want to remember to be praying with and, and for uh, this situation. So please do continue to keep um uh, Pastor Sarah Folian and, and others and um, that are, are, are seeking to to uh, help uh, with the efforts of the re of relief of this situation, uh, this devastating situation. And so without further ado, let us uh, join together uh, for our call to worship. Psalm 42 verses 1 through 4. As a deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night, while they say to me all the day long, Where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I will go with the throng and lead them in procession to the house of God with glad shouts and songs of praise, a multitude keeping festival. Jesus Christ be known wherever we are. 
Our gracious Father in heaven, sovereign author of our every moment, we come to you this day a collection of desperate souls. We lament and weep with anguished hearts, unsettled by sickness, disrupted by loss, and angered by injustice. We've been complicit, complacent, and apathetic. At times we simmer with disappointment, both with ourselves and with others. We struggle to be content as we long for restoration and renewal. We have no right to stand before you, Lord. Yet while our souls may be cast down, your mercy says, come. Not by our own merit, but by the atoning work of our Savior Jesus. And it's in his name that we pray to you, O Father. We confess our personal sins, our corporate sins, and our secret sins. 
Cleanse us, we pray, for the sake of your Son. O great shepherd, good and true, enliven us with gospel joy. Set our souls at rest in the deep, deep love of Jesus. Surround us, shelter us, and steady us by your grace. You are our hope. Amen.
Well, good morning, New City. It's time for the preaching of the gospel. Are you ready for the gospel? For the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to all those who believe. And God's priest's word does not come by any person's might or their own power, certainly not mine, but only by the Spirit, says the Lord of hosts. And so we look for the Holy Spirit to apply his word into our hearts right now, build us up in holiness and comfort, convict us of sin, point us all the more to our Savior, Jesus Christ. So on this morning, we're going to be looking at Mark chapter 5, verses 21 through 24, and then 35 through 43. Going to be looking at against all odds, against all odds. In this passage, we're going to be looking at Jairus. He's going to uh, come to encounter Jesus face to face. Jesus is going to show him and lead him in faith and how he is supposed to be trusting in him. And so when the odds are stacked up, we are to be leaning in God in faith. But are we? And so we're going to be looking at Mark chapter 5, 21 through 24, 35 through 43. Hear now God's word. And when Jesus had crossed again to the boat, To the other side, a great crowd gathered about him, and he was beside the sea. Then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and seeing him, he fell at his feet and implored him earnestly, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her, so that she may be made well and live. And he went with him, and a great crowd followed him and thronged about him. Down to 35. While he was still speaking, there came from the ruler's house some who said, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. And he allowed no one to follow him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. They came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and Jesus saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. And when he had entered, he said to them, Why are you making a commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. Taking her by the hand, he said to her, Talitha Kumi, which means little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately the girl got up and began walking, for she was 12 years of age, and they were immediately overcome with amazement. And he strictly charged them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his very own word. John Smith, a 14-year-old boy from Missouri, found himself waking up on a, a scene like an average morning. His alarm clock probably went off. And he never would have imagined that this day that he would find himself drowning in the Lake St. Louise. John Smith and his friends on a cold, uh, icy day and we're playing on the ice and he fell through and he found himself being in that water for over 15 minutes before he was rescued and overall uh, he didn't have a, a, a pulse or a heartbeat for they say um something like over 60 minutes 
And so being um, in that hospital room and the doctor's working on him, there seems to be nothing else that they can do. It's over. And so they're getting ready to pronounce the time of death. And in the midst of that, his mother walks in, walks in and, and says and prays a prayer to the great physician, simply saying, God, Lord, please save my son. And right in the midst of that, in the, uh, those all around, in the midst of that prayer, something amazing happens. Uh, John, his pulse starts to come back. His heart is beating, though unconscious, he is alive. He's alive against all odds. He is alive. And I'm here to tell you right now that God, even today, still today, God still has the power to do the miraculous. God still has the, 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 the power to take sinners and bring them into his marvelous light. God still has the power to restrain sin in our lives right now, this day. God, the Lord, Yahweh, has all power in his hands. And so as we are to know that and to believe that continually, the thing is, though, when we live life, we recognize that things don't always work out as we would hope that they would. We find ourselves perhaps competing uh, with our doubts in the midst of the overwhelming situations that we are placed in. And so when the odds are stacked up against you, how are you believing? When the odds are stacked up against you, how do you keep on keeping on? How do you keep on trusting? When the odds are stacked up so high it seems, Jesus, how are we therefore to live and proceed Man, when we're facing a dire and devastating situations in our life and circumstances, how, Lord Jesus? As we just read, Mark chapter 5, uh, 21 through 24, we see a man, Jairus, coming boldly and desperately to Jesus to heal his daughter who is close to breathing her very last breaths. One of the things we, we notice right away, as we have read, is that unlike uh, early in this chapter, uh, 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 the woman with the uh, sickness was lifted up. She was unnamed. But unlike in this, these passages of scriptures, we see that the name, a name is given for this character, indicating the, the status of this Jairus. Jairus is one of the synagogue leaders, uh, and um, he probably could have been uh, wealthy, and he's one that would have taken care of the, the physical building of the synagogue, uh, uh, perhaps the, the finances, uh, directing the order of worship, who's going to read the scriptures, who's going to give the homily or the message uh, for that time of worship. And so as we're getting a little bit of information about uh, Jairus, and his status, his known status in the community, we still, uh, we still see this Jairus, even with his status, seeing him coming in all of uh, desperation. So much so that it describes that he falls to Jesus' feet, crying out and begging, begging for this Jesus' help. It makes us wonder, where, are, uh, where do we go when those odds are stacked up? Are we falling at the, the very feet of Jesus when those odds are rising and rising? And when the crowds are watching, when they are there, as we are living before the face of our God, does this Lord on high, does he see us on our knees before him? Jairus, as we look, Jairus was so needy, so needy at this very moment that he, did, he didn't care. He no longer cared about his title or his status or what other people was going to think about him bowing and, and, and begging and falling at the feet of this Jesus. 
Jairus had uh, realized, had begun to realize that no amount, no amount of his prestige uh, or his wisdom or, or his pride had the ability to save his daughter now. And so we talk about Jairus' daughter, I want to... Uh, I want us to, to think about a, a, another daughter, um, a, a daughter that I want to briefly share with you. This daughter I'm talking about is a, is a daughter. Uh, uh, she, she's a, a beauty queen. She's a beauty queen for Thailand. And uh, she did something rather uh, amazing, despite all the prestige that she received from winning this beauty pageant. And so this daughter, this beauty queen, in a nice breast, you know, uh, dress with her, her crown, um, she goes back to her mother, her mother's job, who her profession is uh, uh, one of, of collecting and recycling uh, trash. And this is something that her mother did to raise her daughter. And so this daughter, uh, you know, in a dress, in her, in her, in her, has her, uh, her crown on, uh, she gets on the dirty ground, gets on the knees, her knees, and bows down to her mother to honor her. You see, this beauty queen um, from Thailand, she recognized that she wouldn't have been able to reach uh, the accomplishment uh, or to get to that status of winning this pageant. She wouldn't have been in a position to do so if it wasn't for her mother making sacrifices time in, day in, and day out. And so as we look at our passage, so too Jairus is too realizing that his status doesn't matter. His position, his uh, accomplishments, nothing of the sort matters now, and only in Jesus is where uh, hope can be found. Only in Jesus can he uh, find hope for his daughter? And so in Jairus' case, oftentimes we, uh, uh, in our lives, it takes sometimes the most drastic of situations in our life that we begin to realize that, we, that hope is found, uh, it can be found nowhere else, that it cannot be found in, in our own selves or in our pride or what we can attain for ourselves. And so, now, keep in mind that uh, the, the, the Jewish leaders where, you know, where Jairus would, been have, would have been a, a, a part of that circle, uh, they were the authority. They had authority in the community. And so many were against, actually against Jesus, as we read the scriptures, and they actually doubted who Jesus was and the very miracles that he was doing. And so the thing is, it was their pride their pride that was, that was continually uh, uh, blinding them of the very presence of God before them, the very presence of God's power in the Lord Jesus. And so as God is in our midst, um, maybe in this season of life, this season of life that we're going through, maybe how um, it, it, it are things seeking to rob you? How is our circumstance seeking to rob us of seeing still the very real presence of God's power, um, the very real presence of his, him in our life, even in a time like this? When the obstacles, um, when we can look and they seem like they are stacking against us, where everything is against us, all the odds are against us, whatever it may be, those, um, we are to be, uh, we are to recognize that we can, uh, whatever it may be that those obstacles are rising up, that we are to take those things and present them at Jesus' feet, laying, up, laying it down to him saying that my hope is in you, my, all my care is in you, in you, even though the odds seem to be so stacked, so high. And so early in Mark chapter 5, we, we see how Jesus heals a demon-possessed man who, who calls himself a legion, indicating his might and his strength you know, that, this, this, that this demon had, uh, because no person or no chains had the strength to bind him. But what do we see happen um, early in this chapter, uh, Mark chapter 5? We see this demon, uh, this man uh, uh, that was possessed by demons running to Jesus and like Jairus falling uh, at Jesus' feet and crying out to God in a loud voice with Jesus eventually freeing him of the legion of demons that was possessing him. 
But the people who ran with Jairus, the circles that he was in, they still refused because of their pride to submit to God in faith. And so they, too, they remained blinded. And so when we're holding on to our pride, when we're holding on to our status or, or thinking that everything relies on that, it's real easy to be blinded, continually blinded to the obvious presence the obvious strength of God. And so sometimes in God's providence and really his loving care for us, he strikes down our pride with, with something that, that, that hits close to home. And even a, a synagogue leader like Jairus could no longer uh, doubt this Jesus, but rather he knew, as we see in the passage, with a, with a desperate plea, that Jesus was the only option. And so he, uh, we see Jairus, he, we see him, he intentionally sought after Jesus, submitted to his will, and even allowed God to continually mold his faith all along the way in the process as he was getting to his daughter. And so when we think about the, some of the process we're going through in our life and the things that we are facing, 2020 has been a, 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 a very difficult time this year. And so some of us, you know, even now uh, recognize that there are things that we need to break away from, influences that are, tr that, that are trying to keep our, 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 our prideful and, 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 and try to keep us prideful and fixed on our own abilities or perhaps uh, keep us fearful of other people's opinions. Uh, you know, what are they going to think about us if we, we, if we say something or, or doubting, ultimately doubting the power of God? And so sometimes it's real easy just to kind of lean into, you know, maybe our own popularity, to lean into our own status. And so when we think about maybe and the ways that we, each and every one of us can lean into pride, what are some ways right now that we can, you know, um, to, to, to humble ourselves right now in our, in our context? Do we find ourselves uh, doing the right, not doing the right thing because we don't want people to shun us? And so in every area of our lives, we are to be continually uh, looking to cut off all the whisperings that continue to try to whisper in our ear, the whisperings of the flesh, the whispering of the world, the whispering of the devil as we walk with Jesus. And so we see in this passage that we are therefore to reject pride and rather pursue faith. Reject pride and pursue faith. And so in life's difficult situations, it's real easy to be overwhelmed, uh, to give in to the pressures and the, and, the, and the doubts that can really seem to suffocate us. And so Though those things are there, how can we navigate, Lord, around those things when those things are present? Verse 35 says, while he was still speaking, there came from the ruler's house some who said, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? In verse 35, we hear the report that Jesus's, that Jairus' daughter had died and people are coming to tell him that there's no need to bother Jesus any longer. He doesn't have the power to help you now. Verse 38, they came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue and Jesus saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. And when he had entered, he said to them, why are you making a commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him, but he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. The following verses here, 38 through 40, they reveal that, that the time that Jesus arrived at Jairus' house, if you just read, there's already a large crowd that has formed that they're mourning the death of uh, this young 12-year-old girl. We actually come to this scene um, after leaving another scene um, early in, in this chapter where the very touch uh, uh, of Jesus' garment healed a woman who was suffering from a 12-year-old ailment, disease that no doctor could cure. And so just as this woman was cured in an instant, 
Jesus is basically declaring that, that this morning, that morning this daughter isn't necessary and that the child is only sleeping. So in other words, Jesus is directing, directly stating that there's no reason for any of you to be mourning now. There's no death for you actually to be weeping over. But we see that despite this, this confident and this direct response by the Lord of glory, we don't see trust in those words that just Jesus just uttered. But rather we see ridicule, rather we see uh, mockery that was displayed when they um, began to laugh at him. And so when the things don't work out like we envision, uh, we are not to use that as an occasion to abandon the mission. When obstacles uh, uh, present themselves uh, to, to mock, to ridicule, this is not the opportunity to give in to pressure. I know you see, you see those odds stacking up, but it's not the opportunity to, to give in to the pressure that seems to be pressing in on you. You know, I remember being young in my faith and simultaneously being young in my profession as a videographer. And I remember landing uh, this freelance gig that I was, you know, this video job that I was excited about. And uh, I was you know, at the job and I was surrounded by uh, just an experienced group of camera people. And I was soaking in all the knowledge. But, at, you know, after a while of talking about that, all of a sudden the, the, the situation kind of just shifted. And they began talking about um, how uh, Christianity and the Bible was fake. And, it, and, and they joked about how, um, like, unreal it was. And so right in the middle of that, I find myself so, so afraid to speak up because I wanted them to, to like me. I didn't want to speak up in that situation because I didn't want to be uh, kind of ostracized from, from the group. And so instead, I just remained silent. And I listened silently to the mockery of my Savior, Jesus. That quickly, in an instant, I forgot about the miracles that the Lord had done in my life just recently and what he was continually to do in my life. But I wish I could say that was many years ago that I have never uh, you know, uh, just sat there silent to the mockery of my Savior. Actually, that's not true. Actually, as of recently, even la a few weeks ago, I was just telling Deacon Jared how the other day, uh, you know, I went out quickly to my, you know, to my mailbox and, you know, it's cold outside and, uh, you know, we're social distancing. And, you know, but there was a couple that, um, a lovely couple that came by and th they were walking past and they kind of got into conversation. And uh, the husband kind of mentioned that he was a retired minister. And I began to tell um, him how I, too, was a Christian. And then he uh, kind of proceeded to tell me that, that um, you know, because of the volunteer work that he does and, you know, his experience with, uh, you know, uh, a lot of black males that, uh, with, with violence, that he told me that I was special to be saved, that he kept emphasizing how I was special, I was special. And so it was, it, it was cold outside, um, and, and we were supposed to be social distancing, so I just, you know, didn't say anything, I just remained silent remain silent and listen to, to this mockery of sorts of the Savior. Instead of uh, lovingly coming to this brother and kind of correcting him of his limited view, of this limited view of, of people who are made in God's image. The mockery that kind of says that there's only a certain type of people that are normally saved, and then you have others like me or black males who are kind of specially saved, that they are special if they are to be saved. This rather low view of the very grace of God, listening to this mockery. And so you see, it's very easy in all types of situations uh, and difficult situations to kind of just go with the flow, you know, continually in, or continually to let our voices be silent or to join in with the crowd rather than leaning in and trusting on our God to be with us as we approach these situations. And so what do we see? What do we see Jesus do? We see that Jesus doesn't, in this instant, he doesn't debate um, with his mockers, but his actions aren't, they, they are not silent either. 
Rather, he remained committed. Jesus remained committed, stayed on mission, and focused on caring for Jairus' precious family. Jesus' mind was to come and to seek and save the lost. He was sent to come and take the hits, to take the mockery, the ridicule, the scorn, so that we could be set free. And so sometimes in the midst of our difficulty um, even, um, and even ridicule, when we seek to focus on our attention, we can uh, seek to focus our attention on serving uh, others like Christ is serving us. So not focusing on our ridicule, but seeking how we can lean in on and, and pursuing others as we see Jesus uh, focusing on Jairus' family. And so in the midst of our difficulties or the problems, uh, we can seek to pour out to others. And so the next time perhaps that you are in a, a, a situation and you feel the temptation, you feel the very pressure to mock or to practi practically deny uh, the sovereignty, the, the power and the goodness of God. Seek to prayerfully ask God, Lord, to give uh, uh, us uh, the ability to trust even when we don't uh, fully understand, even when we feel uh, awkward about a situation. And then by, by, by God's grace, we can walk after our Savior continually by rejecting the temptations and the pressures, even though they may seem high, and instead pursue faith, rejecting temptations and pressures and pursuing faith in the Lord Jesus. Verse uh, 41 says, taking her by the hand, he said to her, Talitha uh, Kumi, which means little girl, uh, I say to you, arise. And immediately the girl got up and began walking, for she was 12 years of age, and they were immediately overcome with amazement. There's a, there's a saying that maybe you have heard that says nothing lasts uh, forever. No, we know that things, they come and then they go. Um, and there can seem to be a limit to things. And, and sometimes it's easy to place that logic onto God and his ability. And so before, Jairus told, uh, before Jesus told Jairus' uh, daughter to arise, uh, most people seem utterly convinced that there was a limit to what Jesus could do that maybe he's a good healer, but now that, that his, this daughter is actually dead, it's nothing that he can do now. But that is precisely the opposite of what Jesus um, had been doing throughout um, Mark chapter 5. He was rather showing that, it, that, that there are no limits. God is saying, I have all power in my hands to so trust in me, that there's no demon or stronghold that can resist my might. There's no disease that is strong enough that I cannot cure. And not even the power of death is a match against me. Jesus is showing us that, showing us these things and saying, look at my track record, look at it. And then take your very situation that you have in your life right now, take that thing, grasp a hold of it, no matter how hard it may be, and place them into my care. So get that thing in your mind. And as he told Jairus, believe, only believe that we still trust in the Jesus, no matter what obstacle is stacked against you. And so in here, there will be, we, we may face difficulty at times because we know, uh, we, we know, as I said earlier, that we know that things don't always work out as we uh, will, will imagine them to. Um, we, they don't work out per perfectly as we hope. Evil still persists. Uh, sickness uh, can, can go and perhaps come back again. And if we look out into our world, uh, we're, we'll be facing you know, COVID-19. We look into our world. Death is all around us. The question may arise, why does God allow suffering? Why do you allow suffering? Why do you allow devastation, heartache to persist? And so as we look in this portion of Scripture, it doesn't give us a direct answer to that question, but it does show us, what it does show us in this Scripture, that God is with us and he's cared for us in the midst 
of these difficult and soul-gripping times, that he walked with Jairus all the way. Even when there was a detour, he still was walking with Jairus, with Jairus along the way. Jesus knows himself. He knows about uh, and has experienced grief himself, that he got into it with us and took on it all. He did it on our behalf. And so we must understand that because of sin, we do, yes, we do live in a sinful and fallen world, but God is still working out uh, good for those who love him. And so we are to believe in the sovereign God of the universe who has saved our, our, our soul. Um, that we are to believe that he is still doing great things, even if we don't fully understand. And even we don't fully believe, and when heart, heartache comes, that we are to trust in him. That he is not only good in certain circumstances and not good in the other. And that we are to still place our allegiance to him, even when those, those odds stack up against us. I'm reminded of uh, uh, the three uh, Hebrew boys who found themselves in a situation to either honor the king or to face a, a sure, fiery death. Uh, Abednego, Meshach, and Shadrach knew that obeying Nebuchadnezzar would uh, preserve their lives, but denying this king would bring uh, them to their end. But immediately, even knowing that these three Hebrew boys, uh, even in the midst of that very real threat, they reply, uh, oh, Nebu oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we are uh, not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of, uh, out of thy hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Never, Nebuchadnezzar, he had, had, had thought he had these boys right where he wanted them. That thought that they had no other options. Thought that I am bigger than your God. What are you going to do now other than just bow to me? Surely he had uh, them. Surely they were going to turn on their God now. But instead, uh, these boys make a bold, a very bold proclamation saying, whether we live or whether we die, we're going to serve this Lord, this God. They're saying we're not placing any limits on this God, for we know that he still somehow can deliver and even if we do indeed perish, we're still not placing limits on him because he is still good and he knows best. How many of us can say, still, Lord, you know best? And this motivation of these boys, I want you to think about this. Think about this king that they were ultimately uh, trusting in. Who is the, the one who, being a king, lowered himself even in a dingy manger? Who was the one who was mocked and ridiculed on our behalf? Who was the one who made a way and continually makes a way out of no way for our sinful bodies and souls? And that we can be continually free from our inability to trust by recognizing who our God is. That he is the one is all powerful, no matter the circumstances. And so in this passage, he's asking us to believe in him no matter what, no matter the circumstances. I know what you're going through. No matter the outcome, he is the God who is just. Jesus is the one who is just, who will one day set things right and is making all things indeed new. We can trust in God in all of our circumstances. And so we therefore are to re reject continually our false limitations of God, reject those false limitations on God, and therefore pursue faith. I started out 
talking about a story that was really uh, against all odds, a story of odds. And it was against all odds that this John Smith uh, uh, miraculously uh, came back to life, so much so that a, a feature-length film was developed called Breakthrough of this miraculous story. And in the trailer of this film, there's a scene, another scene when uh, John's mother uh, begins to pray to God. She says, God, whatever you have for John, whatever you have for my family, whatever you have for me, I surrender. And so as we too, we survey our lives. If we survey all the things that's going on in our world, in our life, do we too have such a prayer? A prayer that says that uh, I'm going to rely on you, Lord, no matter what. A prayer that says I trust in you, Jesus, and I believe you are all powerful and you are indeed able and ready to help. But it's also a prayer that says that you are in control and whatever you decide to do, whatever you decide to do, I'm still going to follow you because you are good and trustworthy. And so just like in this passage, every day we are to surrender to a loving God in full dependence on him, rejecting uh, certain things and pursuing faith and running to him. And, and, and placing those, those, those things at his feet, clinging to him more and more. And so as we seek to abide in him more and more, and we see that Jesus is caring with us, he's with us, that we are to believe, we are to know that it is true today, now, and always. And that we are to say, O oh Lord, Whatever you have for me in my life, whatever, when those odds are stacked up against you, they're stacked up against us, we are to continually say, Lord, I surrender. Let's pray. Oh, Lord, oh, Father, we continually surrender to you. Oh, Lord, be with us in the midst of the obstacles that we face continually. Oh, that we throw those things down. Those, those things are real and they lift themselves up on us so high, it seems. But we may throw those things off by your power. Pursue, pursue you continually in faith. One step in front of the other by your grace towards you. Oh, Lord, be with us. We thank you for your care for us. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
O Lord, may you continually guide us as we look towards your Son. Bless us and keep us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.